Hi, Julie and Brett. Thanks for joining me. This is my first podcast for What Fuels You, an Electric Road Trip. And what this podcast is, is about talking with cool people who are driving change in whatever way that fuels them. And so Julie um, Carter is an old friend of mine. We played wiffle ball. We drove together to high school and she is now a biologist. And when I just was back in Arizona talking with her, I just said, what fuels you? And she said, I'm the one that cares about little fish that no, I, I'm the one that likes to save little fish that nobody else cares about. Is that what you said? What was your quote? Yeah, I think that was it. I was trying to explain what I did to a non-biologist and that was the best way that I could come across because that's what we do. <laughs> well, and I love that. And I am a desert girl. I was born, um, not born, I was born in Minnesota, but spent the majority of my youth in Phoenix, Arizona. And though we did go to the lakes and rivers, you don't think of Arizona as a place of a lot of water. And so when, um, you were talking to me what you did. I'm like, I've got to share the story. So today we have um, Julie Carter. We have Brent Montgomery from the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And I really just kind of want to hear what can you share with people on what fuels both of you in um, caring for the little fish that you work with? <laughs> Um, sure. I'm really happy to be here, Erica. So this is super fun. And, um, and I'm glad Brett could join us this afternoon because he's leaving us to go back to graduate school soon. So this is a really great <laughs> send off because he loves this stuff. But yeah. I guess for me, I grew up in the desert too. As you know, we were neighbors and outside all the time. And um, I did a lot of fishing in the White Mountains and whatnot. And then I I ended up in, in Alaska working as a fish research fish biologist, and that's where I really got hooked. Like, totally stupid pun, but it's very true. Um, I couldn't believe how much water there was, that it just, I would stare at the rivers for hours, trying to figure out how that much water could just keep coming. And, um, and same with the fish. So I really, I got eight years of really great work working with these highly migratory, very abundant trout and salmon. And then I ended up for family reasons back where I came from. And here all of the fish there were barely seeming to survive. They were hanging on because of really passionate people helping them stay on the planet. And um, I just was inspired and I'm happy to be doing it. I've been doing it for 15 years now at Arizona Game and Fish, love my job, wouldn't wouldn't change it for the world. I get to work with super passionate people like like Brett. Everyone that works with us is so passionate and they love these fish. And um, so yeah, it's just, it's inspiring. What about you, Brett? What's, what fuels you with this career choice you've taken and graduate school you're pursuing? Yeah, yeah, it's it's all the same stuff, and like Julie's mentioning, um, passion is a huge part of it. And every time I hire an intern for the summer, I really ask them, like, are you passionate about this stuff? Because we do a lot of really tough work. We're out in the field, we're hiking miles and miles, we're spending three or four days camping, and really, if you don't have the passion for the work, you get you get burnt out and you get kind of tired of it. And so um, that's a huge part of why I keep doing it and why I love it. Um, I went to college and I just chose a major in applied biological sciences, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And as I was going through all of my classes, I had various field trips that we went out and we were working with different species and just experiencing various field techniques. And that's really what got me hooked. I was like, wow, this is really fun. We're constantly outside. We get to interact hands-on with all of these species of snakes, frogs, fish, birds, um, and just 
it was so cool to me. I had no idea that that was a career option even. And so as I went through all those classes, I found out what I liked more, what I liked less. And um, then I really got on the track of this career when I got an internship with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And um, it was an absolute blast. That was really what got me turned on to fish work. Um, and then I had various jobs after that and here we are today. And yeah, it's, it's fun, um, really rewarding work that just, you're helping conserve species and it's so worth it to see them once you like have a population that exploded or something and then it's, it makes it all worth it. So tell me, what does the Arizona Game and Fish Department do? Like for our audiences listening, what, what is it that um, you manage and help? That's a great question. So we're the State Wildlife Agency and we have trust responsibility for over 800 species of wildlife. So that can include everything, fish, wildlife, you know, that includes birds and our elk and deer populations and reptiles and mice, it's, it's all of the above. So um, one of our uh, part, like part of something that we do at the department is called conserve and protect. Um, that's a big, um, not slogan necessarily, but it's a big message that we've been putting out to try to um, give the public awareness of what we do as an agency, conserve and protect. So we're constantly conserving wildlife and protecting them for future generations of Arizona res residents. That's it in a nutshell. And specifically in your department with fish, um, tell me a little bit more detail what each of you, you work with I have to admit, fish that I have never heard about and, <laughs> and that you're like, very passionate you know? about. <laughs> yeah, so in so we work in um, the aquatic wildlife branch at Arizona Game and Fish Department and we're part of that. And so there's eight of us when we're fully staffed um, that are in the program. And then we also have different regions, um, regional offices. So we have six regions and there's native fish specialists at those regions. And we work together collaboratively with other agencies as well, um, like our federal partners um, that own the lands and the public lands and manage the public lands like the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. And we work to conserve and protect 35 species of native fish. So there's a lot of other states that might have well over a hundred native fish species. Um, we don't have that many in comparison because we live in the desert. So a lot of our fish are imperiled um, because we have reservoirs and dams and we have to you know, provide drinking water to residents. So a lot of the fish got displaced to more headwater habitats and that's where we really focus a lot of our, our efforts um, in our program. So like two thirds of the species are federally threatened or endangered. Um, so we work hard to make sure that they don't go um, extinct. We've only had one species go extinct in our state and we're trying to make sure um, that they don't. So we have a lot of common species too and we try to keep our common species common by doing a lot of um, conservation work and efforts to make sure that they aren't federally listed in the future. So that's that's it in a nutshell, but it's a lot of work. It's not just putting the fish out on the landscape all over. When they are federally protected, um, there are strings attached and um, with the Endangered Species Act. So we have to jump through all the hoops to get them out on the landscape. And it takes a lot of time and perseverance and patience, but we, we do it. Yeah, and so for my job in particular, working under Julie in the Native Aquatics program, I'm just one program out of uh, four or five. There, We have the Native Trout and Chub program, which is my program, and then we also have a Colorado River program, a Gila River Basin program, and um, then a Top Minnow Pupfish program. Uh, so we each, uh, focus on 
various species. And I work with the round tail chub, the Apache trout, and the Gila trout, which are Arizona sport fish, native sport fish in particular. And what that means for me is like the boots on the ground work is going out monitoring populations in streams all across the state, wherever these species occur. And then um, we also will uh, stock species into new areas um, or we'll uh, just rejuvenate populations by stocking uh, some different individuals from a different population of the same genetic lineage. And so it's a lot of just like actual hands-on management of these species rather than like a certain research project. We also have a research branch in the department that uh, maybe has a question and then sets up a study design and answers a specific question to inform some of our management while we do the boots on the ground management. That's, that's, uh, this is so interesting because I, like I said, I'm not familiar with all this. That's why I love this for a podcast. Um, so what we all know, like, uh, threats, what are, everybody hates the doom and gloom of what are threats, but what are they and what are you doing to try and help reduce those threats? That's a great question. And that's one of the biggest things that we work on are removing threats. Um, the species unfortunately need human in intervention to, to stay on the landscape um, because we, we have a lot of humans out there um, and we do, you know, we can't take away big cities just because of some native fish species. We have to learn to work with everything around us and see how we can be creative to keep them on the landscape. So non-native fish species are a big issue um, for these natives. So, you know, back at the turn of the last century, um, where people were moving fish all over the place to provide fish for families. So people could catch their own food. Um, times of the Great Depression, it's right when hatcheries started to boom and, um, we started to put fish, fish everywhere and we didn't realize that there were consequences to the native species and that they had not evolved with any natural predators, um, at least not many, not like the ferocious ones we were about to introduce. And so they become displaced and that, you know, was part of the impetus of the Endangered Species Act. Um, some of the fish species in our state were listed when the Endangered Species Act just had formed and became um, official. So over the time, over the years, we've gotten creative with how we manage threats, but it's not just those species, it's also the landscape. So you have also got climate change and we have mega fires, mega wildfires in our state now, like the Wallow Fire that was up in the White Mountains in 2011. Um, that was catastrophic to many of our native fish populations. And it doesn't just take a couple years for that damage to go away. So when, when you have a big, huge wildfire, um, they're usually in, you know, May, June, and then what's next? The monsoons. And then the monsoons come and they flood our riparian systems and deprive the streams of oxygen and we have huge fish kills. So a lot of what we do in May and June and early July is we're ready on standby for fish salvages. So um, our program today that um, folks that were on the call today participated in a bunch where they actually go out, salvage those fish for the monsoons, hold them somewhere safely until they could go back. Um, the, the Forest Service and other land management agencies are trying to be more proactive about their forest management um, rather than reactive. So there's there's a number of habitat restoration initiatives to try to work on forest thinning and different things like that to make the habitat more resilient. And then um, for us as the fisheries managers, we can manage those fish. So we can 
try to manage the non-native fish species as best as possible. Sometimes we do removal efforts where we go out and actually remove those non-native fish species. Um, oftentimes we build fish barriers, so they're small dam or small dams um, that prevent upstream passage of uh, non-native fish. And then upstream of those barriers are where we restore the native fish. So we're trying to isolate them and give them some areas that are void of the non-native fish to to thrive. Wonderful. Um, so how do you how do you stock like well first of all how do you monitor like brett you were saying you monitor how how do you monitor how many fish are in a river or lake yeah so many different ways uh we have a variety of fish monitoring techniques and sampling techniques that we use um one of the biggest ones is probably uh backpack electrofishing uh which is when we we have a backpack unit that's uh like all in one, you wear it on your back and you have an anode and a cathode. And what you do is you take that out, you shock the water and it stuns the fish. And then you net them up, put them in a bucket and they're fine. Um, you have to check the settings to make sure that it's fine based on the conductivity of the water. Um, but it stuns these fish and then we'll count them, measure them, identify the species uh, and then put them back. And with that information, whether we're doing a small transect or a full pass of a certain area, we're able to um, look at some of the population dynamics and we can um, inform future management based on how many species were there for that uh, one section and then extrapolate that and uh, kind of get an idea of what the population size looks like. Um, and that's just one example. We also have other techniques like using a seine net, which is just pulling a net through the water and sampling fish that way. Uh, we also use various traps like hoop nets and minnow traps, which some people use for crayfish trapping or um, catching minnows to fish with in areas where you're allowed to do that. So there's so many different um, techniques and those are mainly stream techniques that I'm talking about. There's also uh, different lake techniques where you're using um, a boat to electrofish and also um, setting gill nets in the water where a fish will get stuck in the gill net and then you pull it up and get them out of the net. Um, yeah, there's all different types of sampling techniques. And somebody has a dog on our call today too. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's not it's not my dog. I have Bentley here snoozing because otherwise it could be my dog. Um, <laughs> my sister's dog actually. Um and so and then you also talk about stocking fish and I, I love some of the pictures you sent earlier that I'll put on the call here, but um the stocking, how what are some ways you stock fish? <laughs> The stocking is so much fun. Um, I don't get out in the field as much as I used to anymore because I'm more of a program manager now, but I still try to get out on the stocking, the stocking efforts. So um, stocking is so interesting because it's not like what you think of when a hatchery truck drives up to a stream or a lake and they might, um, you know, net fish from the hatchery truck and then into the to the lake. Um, this is where we're, we, we don't always get fish from the hatchery. Sometimes we take them from another stream. So first we go out and have a crew go out and sample and collect the fish that we're gonna move and then um, transport them that way and then get to the other stream. And a lot of times it's on our backs. So we have big frame pack back backpacks and we have five gallon buckets and we fill them with a little bit of water and a lots of oxygen in a bag. Um, and then we hike and it depends on where you are. Um, sometimes the hike is a mile, sometimes it's three miles and all uphill um, or more. Um, sometimes it's really hot out. And um, so there's different seasons that we do it and um, it depends on how many fish. So we, we try to get a lot of people to help us, especially young people, 
with young backs. <laughs> so we take full advantage of the fact that they don't have bad backs yet to go the farthest. So I don't go to the farthest anymore. I volunteer for the for the easier ones, but it's so fun. And um, occasionally we have used horses to help us haul the fish. And we did use llamas for the first time this um, summer in June, which was just so fun and such a novelty because they were llamas. I mean, you can't go wrong with a llama at work. So one other, um type of stocking that we do and that we've been doing the past couple of years is egg stocking and we've done this with our native trout species uh, specifically the gila trout and the way it worked was we got eggs from the hatchery they had spawned the fish that they have and gave us excess eggs and we took them to the stream and using this uh, cool tool that's just like this metal funnel, probably about, uh, um, it's hard to show on the video, but it's probably about three feet long and then it has this little tube, um, kind of like a huge syringe. Um, and what we do is we build a little nest in the stream of cobble and gravel, um, various sizes of substrate and then we put the eggs in the funnel and flush them down with water into the nest or on top of the nest, depending on the flow of water. And um, essentially we're just emulating what a mama trout would be doing uh, by creating the nest and then laying the eggs in it. Um, and it really gave me a sense of ownership over those eggs. And uh, like, <laughs> I felt like their mom. And so, uh, that has been super cool. We tried it for the first time in the spring of 2019 and it worked out tremendously. Like we uh, checked back a couple months later, the eggs had hatched. There were these little fry just swimming around. And so we we're making that and incorporating that into our management and stocking um, as a primary method because it's way easier to take thousands upon thousands of eggs to a stream rather than hauling a bunch of fish in buckets with a whole crew of people, which has come in handy this year during the pandemic, pandemic actually. And so, yeah, that's another cool uh, version of stocking that um, not everyone does. It was, it was definitely novel to us um, mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, that's a good point. That was super fun. And we were all experimenting with it. So we felt like scientists and um, and the fact that they all hatched and there's just hundreds of fish in the stream that was fishless before, we do feel a sense of, uh, yeah, they're parented, I guess. <laughs> Very proud. <laughs> That's great. I can see how you could take ownership. That's why, like, you were on a classroom talk this morning with kids and they find when kids take ownership of the trees they plant or the fish they return, you know, they have more ownership of caring for that. Um, so my my big question is, we know it fuels you. Why should people care? Why do they care if these fish, other than that, we should all care because we don't want things going endangered, extinct, and, and we know that, but, but what's their, why should people care? Great question. I'll, I guess I'll give my spiel on why I think people should care and Brett can give his. Um, I was actually asked this on the job interview that my first job interview with Game and Fish Department, that was one of the questions on the interview. And and it's easy to, to answer when you're so passionate about the fish, but when you are just going to tell someone that might not know anything about the fish, how do you convince them that it's important? And it kind of, to me, goes back to our state, um, for instance. So we live in the desert Southwest. We deal with fish environment, right? We have, you know, mountains in the desert for the most part, and then we have high of elevation, but it's still more deserty than anything else. And we have these endemic fish that have been here 
forever that have evolved to learn with all of these and evolved to adapt to all of these conditions all the time and how interesting that is. And you could go through each one of our 35 species and find something really cool about those species. And it makes you just think about, I don't know, the, the hardships that they've had to deal with all, all of these years and, and they're still here. And then you, you talk about, well, what about the rainbow trout? Well, the rainbow trout have their own native range. They're, you know, west of the Sierras, they have their native range and they've been introduced across the entire world. Um, there isn't that uniqueness with them when they're outside of their native range. So to me, it's just, it's doing something for the environment, um, the ecosystem, it's getting back to, you know, where um, we started. So that's kind of it for me. Yeah, it can be hard to relate it to the layman um, when, when, like Julie said, you have the passion that they just can't even comprehend. Um, but oftentimes I find that when I'm talking to people uh, from every different stage of life and different career paths, they love what I do. They're like, wow, that's so cool. And so then I'm like, oh, this is my in. You know, this is where I can educate somebody about native species and about what I do. And so in those moments, if, unless it's like a, it has to do something with a policy that, like if we have to change a policy to protect native species and there's a financial interest, those are the tough conversations. But when it just comes to somebody who doesn't know anything about native species, um, it's way easy to explain to them like, yeah, well, the native species heritage that they leave um, here in the state of Arizona is, in particular is really important. Like, like Julie said, they've evolved here and um, there's some species that don't exist anywhere else, like the Apache trout. And so it's just really cool to explain that to them. Like, yeah, well, these species are really important on this landscape and you may not realize it because they're all small and inconsequential. You can't eat them, but they're really cool species. Like you go and work with them, you look at them, some of their uh, morphology, like the way they look, and um, especially some of the species that change color when they're spawning. It gives you a whole different appreciation for how they've evolved, how tough they are in the desert of all places to survive these harsh conditions. And that's why I love them and that's why I appreciate them. And once I explain all these and show pictures um, and just get people to understand how cool they are, that's where you make progress. Um, and then you have to take it further for the the people with financial interest that don't want species on their landscape because of whatever farming or whatever they do i don't know isn't that isn't that good that like we have to be at a place where we can appreciate things just for their intrinsic value not because they bring economic value or because they do this or that for us it's like they're valuable because they were here first and they need to be here and we've interrupted them being here and we need to save them and continue. You know, I just, I love what you're doing and what this, what your work is because I don't think we always need to have a, why should I care? We need to just care because they're here, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that too kumbaya -ish? Oh, no. Not at all. Not with this group right here. You're amongst friends. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's like when I talk in Minnesota about birds, why do we care? It's like, because they're beautiful. Do we need another reason? Because they're here and we need to keep them here. Like, we don't need a reason that it's going to attract more tourists or that it's going to bring more, you know, we just, uh, anyway, I admire your work. And um, is there anything you wanted to share with, um, about your work with audiences? Is that like, for example, is there anything people can do to, you know, we see a lot of threats, we, we hear a lot of things that is a lot of times we feel out of our control. What are things we can do as people to be like, I want to volunteer, I want to get active or do something. Any ideas? 
Well, there's like, there's passive things that you can do and there's active things that you can do to help the environment. Um, like you mentioned, volunteering, I'd say as an active thing you can do is like go out, volunteer, kind of understand nature or like what we do as an agency, um, get that hands-on experience and then you can uh, kind of comprehend what all goes into protecting the environment and these species in particular. And then I'd say some of the more passive things you can do to help protect native species, especially in the desert is like, use less water. Um, don't just let the faucet run. Don't let your shower run. Um, use less, you know, single use plastics. Uh, don't litter, pick up trash, go do a trash pickup or something. Like, I don't know, those are easy things that you can do. And I guess there's a blurred line in between active and passive. But for me, if you're just at home and you're in control of your water usage, that's such an easy thing. And uh, it can help preserve water here in the desert, which is uh, getting uh, harder and harder to do as time goes on. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I think we, we could use more advocates. Um, my earpiece might blink out on me. Um, so let me know if you can't hear, but I think we could always use more advocates for these native species because, um, you know, they aren't as popular, like Brett said, they're not the big um, sport fish. They're not the huge trophy trout and salmon and different things like that. Um, so we can use more advocates that just appreciate their presence and uniqueness um, all over the place. And yeah, it's not necessarily watchable wildlife. Fish aren't like birds or something like that, but you can be on a stream and know what's in that water and know how special it is and you want to protect the environment that they live in. So just like the littering thing or anything like that, I mean, any kind of cleanup, um, habitat restoration projects, different things like that. They have projects where people do revegetation on, on the streams, on the Bureau of Land Management. All of those things are going to help improve the riparian area where our fish are. So there, there are things that, that people can do and um, getting involved with science classes like you're doing is really great because those kids might not be getting it at home um, their parents might not be biologists and like I shove it down my daughter's throat all the time so she knows but um, so those getting the kids involved so that they learn at a young age how cool these animals are and how you can protect them I think there's some avenues out there to to get involved for sure and also especially this year um don't start forest fires and be more aware when you're out recreating. Like there's been record numbers of people who have been out camping and exploring the outdoors um, because of the coronavirus. And so when you're out there, just be aware of how you're impacting the environment, uh, what your UTV is doing when you go off trail, what it could be destroying. Um, if you discard a cigarette or don't manage your fire what could the damage be that if that got out of control um just those things i mean anyone can do it pick up all the trash at your campsite um they're very simple things that a lot of people just don't think about because um they think that there's no consequence to that or that someone else might clean it up after them that's wonderful yeah i love all this because it's it is a growing problem, I know. It's good that people are getting outside, but we also have to remember what our impact is and how we can lessen that and still enjoy the outdoors. Um, one of the things, we've got a couple minutes left here. One of the things that we talk about is climate change and the impacts of climate change. So um, could one or both of you give a, a quick statement on how does climate change impacting your work and the lives of these fish you're protecting? I, just in the 15 years I've been here, I've seen a dramatic change in in the higher elevations, the water flows and, and temperatures. We take a lot of temperatures of, of the water because at a certain temperature, it's it's higher than, than the fish species that live there that they can tolerate. And, um, and it's just drought. We have extreme drought 
Um, and our fish need that water. So our habitat is shrinking as a result of, of climate change. Our, our habitat is shrinking, which means less water and less fish. So it's a pretty big deal. And there's a cascading effect, like Julie mentioned earlier about um, the massive bear wallow wildfire that happened in 2011. When there's wildfires, it gets rid of that canopy and those tall trees that help uh, shelter the stream and help keep the water temperatures cooler and uh, prevent evaporation from happening. And so when that canopy is gone after a massive wildfire, then that stream is going to dry up, the temperatures are going to be hotter, the fish won't be able to survive, and so it just keeps cascading uh, until it gets worse and worse and worse, and it's harder for us to recover those streams when we'd have to wait decades for that canopy to return. Um, and so we just have to be very aware of those types of things. It's like, it starts small and then it just gets, it snowballs and um, to the point of no return sometimes. Well, thanks both of you, Julie and Brett, for joining me on What Fuels You. I hate to cut it short because I could talk all day. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. And um, uh, I hope to visit you again when I'm back to Arizona, but in person. So when yes. I What Fuel you, Fuels You road trip comes to Arizona, I'll be back. Yeah, okay. thanks for having us. Right. We can't wait. Thank you, Erica. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.